You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks. This session features Stephanie Johnson in conversation with Kerry Sunderland. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the final session of this year's 2019 Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks. I'm sure I probably have met all of you by now, but I'm Kerry Sunderland, the coordinator of Puka Puka Talks, part of the fabulous Nelson Arts Festival team. And I'm absolutely delighted to be um, on stage here with Stephanie Johnson today to talk about her latest book, West Island Five. 20th century New Zealanders in Australia. Because if you haven't already worked it out, I'm an Aussie. <laughs> Does it sound like I am? And I, I just want to tell a really quick story first um, before introducing Stephanie properly. Um, I, got, I lost my top twins virginity last night. <laughs> I, of course, I've heard of the top twins. You be careful when you say that, love. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> still got a rip. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, I didn't even think of it like that. But anyway, let me soldier on forward. Uh, I, uh, I, I knew a little bit of them, but I didn't really know their music and I certainly didn't know what their live shows would be like. And as we were driving there, David said, come on, go a bit faster, we're going to be late, we don't want to be heckled. And I'm like, surely they're not going to heckle a guy on crutches. Um, but it, I didn't go think beyond that. So five minutes into the show when they asked who was from overseas... And if there were any international people there, and I, I put up my hand. What an idiot. So I got picked on. I had sausages <laughs> thrown at me. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, except for it was actually probably a piece of trit. So anyway, <laughs> sorry. I just had to, to tell that. Because it's one of the themes we're going to explore in this session, as well as looking at the fabulous five biographies that um, Stephanie has written in her book. Um, we're also going to look at your time in Australia and also the relationship between Australia and New Zealand. So, but first, before we do that, I'm going to have some water because I'm running out of saliva again. <laughs> so, a, a proper introduction for Stephanie. Since the much loved The Heart's Wild Surf in 1996, Stephanie has published 11 more novels. Is that right? It's about yeah, that. About that. <laughs> She is the past winner of the Montana Book Award for The Shag Incident, the Catherine Mansfield Fellowship in Menton, and the Bruce Mason Playwriting Award. She has also held the University of Auckland's Writer's Residency, and several of her novels <coughs> excuse me, have been long-listed for the Impact Awards in Dublin. With Peter Wells, um, Stephanie founded the highly successful Auckland Writers' Festival in 1998. So she knows writers' festivals very well, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Known also for her poetry, plays and short stories, Stephanie currently lives in Auckland. She was last at the Nelson Arts Festival, I think it was in 2015? Yeah, it wasn't that. Like, this is my third, third visit. Third visit. Yeah. To discuss the Writers' Festival, which was the first, the first time I interviewed you for, on the radio for that, for that session. Her most recent novels are... Is it Gerilyn? Gerilyn. Gerilyn by the River, which was published by HarperCollins in 2017, and The Sister's Lover, which was self-published in 2019 um, under the pseudonym Lily Woodhouse. So we'll talk a little bit more about that book later on as well. Stephanie says she is a proud sixth-generation New Zealander. So I'd like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about how your, you became... A sixth generation New Zealander. If you want to go back six generations, <laughs> tell us a little bit of your your family ancestry. Oh, I, um, I'll tell you a very little bit. Yeah, because if you're really that keen, uh, you can. Um, I've, I've written about <laughs> this particular ancestor's life um, in a, a novel called The Open World. And I gave her her real name in the novel. And there are a lot of historical figures in the no in that novel, like uh, Bishop Selwyn and uh, various other uh, sort of uh, uh, predominant Māori and, and Pākehā of that time. But, yeah, Elizabeth Horlock smith she came out to New Zealand in 1841 with, um, with, with Bishop Selwyn um, as the um, 
a lady companion to uh, Mary Martin Smith, and to Mary Martin. What am I saying? Um, the and um, she, but she she women weren't trained so much as nurses in those days. But they were, if you were sort of good at it, you ended up doing it. And she she did do a lot of nursing um, up in the sort of upper North Island. And she also uh, ran a native hospital, so called, um, in in what we now call Judges Bay in in Parnell. But like many of those early um, settlers, which is something which we don't talk about so much, often the boats were just as full going back as they were coming out. And she lived here for about uh, 20 years, so she had her, and she had two sons, but which were probably, these two sons probably had different fathers. She was pretty wild. There, there were uh, some of the um, kind of more straight-laced people that knew her uh, were quite rude about her. She was very opinionated and quite tall and, um, and very strong and, and could sort of work tirelessly. But she also had very beautiful handwriting, so she'd had some form of education. I mean, we, you know, I have Bishop Selwyn in the novel. I have him saying to her on the ship when she'd done something to annoy him, which he had done, where she'd dressed up these men in women's dresses. And also she'd made this thing called, uh, uh, I can't remember the name she gave it, but it was a drink that she'd made out of um, opium and uh, whiskey and everyone was completely smashed off their faces and he didn't like that either. And, uh, and when he asked her what her name was and she, t she told him Elizabeth Smith and he said, he says to her, the, Smith, the, col the colonies are full of Smiths and Johnsons. And, um, and, and, and of course, it, for most of these people, it wasn't their real name. So, you know, you were, in those days, there were a lot of people escaping a past, and, I, and even though I did try, and many of my uh, thousands of relatives, I'm sure, have also tried at, at times to find out what the true story was, we don't really know. I knew certain facts, and I sort of based the, the novel uh, around that. So, um, but uh, yeah, we live in um, odd times, and, um, uh, and you know, when we were children, as I'm sure many of you will remember, the word pioneer was something to be proud of. Well, it isn't now. <laughs> no. So the book itself is actually a really interesting blend. It's part biography. West Island, yeah. You yeah, mean, your, yeah, the yeah, West yeah. Island book, sorry. This one. this one, the new one, <laughs> um, is part biography, part memoir, and also one thing I really love about it as well is that it's sprinkled with your ref musings on the life of a writer and the state of the New Zealand literary world. And I love one of your quotes in here. I think it was about Dulcie. Writers, was it about, I'll read it to you and you, you might remember. I Writers can get overexcited during interviews, the long hours alone and the intimacy with fictional people. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, so, was, that was Jean Devaney. Oh, Jean, that was Jean, okay. Yeah. And Jean Devaney is actually someone you can claim. She, she was born in Ferntown, which is, doesn't exist anymore. It's a ghost town that was near Nelson. And, uh, and then she, and she was born in the late 19th century. Her, her father was a, a miner. No, actually he was a boiler maker, but he, he, he worked in the mines. And um, they went up to uh, Collingwood. They lived in Collingwood for a while. And then when she married very young, at the age of 18, she lived in a little town called Puponga. Do you know, mm -hmm. right up by Farewell Spit there. And, um, she 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 wrote a, a novel which was regarded as being very scandalous uh, called The Butcher Shop, which had a renaissance. It was republished in the early early 1980s, and she's she wrote some um, some, some of her novels are actually wonderful. Uh, you know I think she's very neglected, but um, she she you know as, you know from reading the book when she went to Australia she or even before she went to Australia, she was a very committed communist. And so she, um, a lot of her, she, at the end of her life she regretted this, where she had allowed her political sensibilities to override her artistic sensibilities. And so some, some of her books are, are kind of verging on being polemics. And, um, but yeah, she said that. She mm. was interviewed, that, that was Robin Hyde actually, who came to interview her. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and, and she was just about to leave, and uh, this was when, um, not long after The Butcher Shop um, was published. And The Butcher Shop was banned in New Zealand. It was banned in Nazi Germany. It was, it was banned, it wasn't banned in Australia, but it was banned in various other countries. In New Zealand, we banned it, or our Labour government banned it at the time, not, not because of its um, openness about sex, 
and people having sexual relationships outside marriage, but because she had included in this novel a story about a couple of bushmen who'd gone on a bender and one of them had woken up in the morning with the most frightful hangover and asked his mate to cut his head off, so his mate did. <laughs> and um, this, was a, this, was <laughs> this was a famous case at the time. It was in the papers. And um, anyway, she obviously, this story had appealed to her, so she sort of put it in the book. Also, she had included in the book some farming practice, uh, um, um, maybe some ex-farmers here, I don't know, you might have to help me. There's a what, the thing where they, is it the flensing the sheep? Anyway, it's bloody and cruel to a townie's eyes, and and so um, the, you know they didn't like that either. They thought that it put our agriculture in bad light. So it, yeah, it was it was nothing to do with um, sex and naughtiness. It was to do with blokes cutting each other's heads off and cruel farming practice. <laughs> Was, I, I just can't recall completely, I don't think that was the reason that she left New Zealand, though, the banning of that book. No, no, it? She, but it might have been a factor in, in her... No, she had this idea that the depression would be easier in, wasn't as bad in Australia, but actually by the time they got there, this was early in the depression, 1923, I think. Um, and she also had a son who they thought had a sort of... Um, well, they didn't in those days. They didn't really know what was wrong with him, but, uh, but they and they th they thought that he would be better in uh, in the in the climate in Sydney, but he wasn't. And, and in fact, he died at the age That's of right. eighteen. Yeah. So family was the main thing. Yes, and also ha she and Hal, um, at Hal, Hal Devaney, who, whom she married, who was a very good-looking and quiet and sweet man, and and she she. She was no oil painting, dear Jean, and um, and she was also very uh, obstreperous and um, opinionated, and um, they when they were living up in uh, and when they were mining up in Puponga, a lot of the the um, kind of early unionists in Australia and the lead, leaders of the early uh, sorry in New Zealand the leaders of the labour movement were Australians. Mm. And um, you know Bob Semple, um, you know Mickey Savage was an Australian. There was, there was a whole heap of them, and um, and so I think that kind of awakened her curiosity about about Australia, mm. and um, and and they yeah they just thought like so many of us do, and um, especially these days rapidly disabused of this notion, um, life will be easier in, mm. in you know in in West Island. So that's great because that's a beautiful segue. Let's let's we'll come back to our five New, New Zealanders <laughs> in a minute. But um, I'm curious to know how many other Australians are in the audience. In a show of hands, if there's any other Aussies in here, a handful. But this will be a more in interesting one, perhaps. How many pe people here have lived in Australia for any time? Ah, there we go. <laughs> Well, it's just across the ditch. Yeah, yeah. So I'm interested in exploring that this relationship between. But what I, what I want to ask you first is, I when I moved to New Zealand seven years ago now, it was a few years into my time here that I started. Someone planted it in my mind the idea of calling Australia West Island, and I thought, oh, that's brilliant. So it's going to be West Island. But where did where was the origins of it for you? that notion of Australia being the West Island? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think it's just something that's been in the zeitgeist. I actually thought initially that I'd made it up, which of course I thought I so too. No, I, well, I don't think I did. <laughs> no, and, I don't. Um, and in fact, my agent in Australia said she'd seen it in an ad on Australian TV um, where there was some, there was some, you know, making fun of New Zealanders. <laughs> uh, I don't even know, it was an ad for a bank, or she couldn't, didn't even t remember what it was, but she, she sort of pricked up her ears when she heard the... Anyway, I think it should catch on. I, you know, I think we should call it West Island more than anything else. Yeah. We've got questions yeah. later, aren't we? Sorry, we're just recording and we can't hear you properly in the recording. I'd love, when we go to questions, could you share that with us then? Is that fine? Thank you. Um, the other thing about it is that if you can see the cover here, or you might have seen it at the bookshop, like Australia is a lot smaller than New Zealand. <laughs> well, they asked Tell me if I had any that. idea. Um, Otago University Press, Rachel Scott down there, said, do you have any idea about um, the cover? And I said, yes, I want a map of Australia and New Zealand with Australia made much smaller and brought much closer. 
and um, and would you who would you like? And so they got Anna Crichton to do it, and it's very cheeky. She's put a little boat, and she's got a little Māori compass, and she's. <laughs> <laughs> So do you think <laughs> this cover and the name will... Actually, I'm going to hold that question till the end because I'm just interested about Australians in Australia buying it. We'll come back to that at the end, I promise. Um, David Hertz wrote in, your, in the your Weekend Review, in an era when Australia is happy to incarcerate and deport New Zealand citizens, Johnson's experience and the history she relates are of vital con- consequence. So in, you know, the, the relationship between Australia and New Zealand has changed markedly in the last, what, 10 years, has mm, it, um, mm. under the, the Liberal government. Mm. Um, so would you like to comment on that? The relevance of your what you've done to to the current understanding of our trans. Well, it, it just sort of struck me that we hadn't really ever had a kind of general kind of history or a kind. Of, I, I mean, I'm, in the academic world, I was assured by a, 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 um, a professor, an Australian woman actually, who was teaching at uh, Waikato, but now she's got moved back to Australia. I don't, she's teaching in one of the universities over there now. But um, she said there has, of course, been lots of um, work in the academic world, but in, in terms of um, uh, you know, a sort of m- m- more of a, ma- a mainstream and more entertaining because, mm. you know, I, I think a lot of the reviewers have talked about how funny West Island is at times, uh, you know, to, to a more entertaining kind of look at our relationship. My um, son, Skyscraper Stan, who was uh, playing here, he, he went to live in Australia 10 years ago now, which has been the source of endless anguish for me. <laughs> and, um, and of course, many of us, I'm, I'm constantly meeting uh, New Zealanders of my age or a bit younger or a bit older, who their families are all across the across the ditch, and um, and and you know I just thought let's have a look at these people who I mean you know when I mean Māori started going to Australia a, a, a lot once we had once we had the um, fern the, sorry the Cody and uh, fur seal trade, and um, in, sort of in the very early days in the eighteen in the eighteen thirties. And um, and then you know for us there's always been this, but at you know, at the, I, I I don't think people are aware so much of 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 all the other New Zealanders that went there before them, mm. you know. And in terms and I think particularly too in terms of I mean nationalism is a you know a bit of an, another one of those dirty words at the moment, but most of us do have a sense of you know of of. If we are New Zealanders, we're New Zealanders. I mean, you you're, you feel Australian. I'm, my my husband feels Australian, although he's just taken New Zealand citizenship. Ooh, I'm going to too. <laughs> but um, but you know, I think uh, yeah. I just I just thought as a very rich uh, vein to to mm. mine, and 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 I had sort of through my reading over the years because I've read a lot of Australian. Um, literature, I read a lot of Australian writers, I was always very interested in people that had sort of been able to straddle the ditch because it's something very, very hard, you know, many of us have tried and failed. You know, you get told, no, you're a New Zealander or no, you're an Australian. And and um, and I just, you know, that's that in itself is fascinating. Why? Mm, mm. Do you think Australia is to New Zealand what the US is to Canada? Or is it, I think you say, um, you, you tell a story about Stan calling Kiwis, the Mexicans of Australia. So is, 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 is New Zealand more of the Mexico to, to America? Well, I think what happens is because a lot of, the, lot of us that go over, we're young. And of course, we're, you know, we're wanting to, um, to, we have to get a job, obviously, uh, to survive. And, um, and so, you know, a lot of New Zealanders do end up doing jobs that the Australians won't do. But that, that's the immigrant experience. And, and, of, and of course, it's made, what's, it was the beginning of the rot. Sad as I, I am to say this, because I love Helen Clark, but she, she and Johnny Howard signed, and I think it was around 2005, Five, which which meant that New Zealanders could no longer go on the dole in in Australia, which um, was a problem. You know, we did we did have these particularly young New Zealanders heading over there, and the and the Australian dole was worth a lot more than the New Zealand dole. New Zealanders could live very frugally and but quite well on it. But what came very quickly after that was excluding us from their universities. You know, so now like um, a nephew of mine uh, who's over there is really smart young man wanted to go to university well he because he's a New Zealander he would have had to have paid foreign student thing whereas young Australians can come here and go to our universities as New Zealanders so so we we haven't we haven't which is very good of us we're very generous and big-hearted we have not played tit-for-tat on that one 
But I think, I think that was when that all shifted. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm constantly feeling guilty about it and considering becoming a New Zealand citizen. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim and I will have to compare notes. Um, because, of course, I was astonished that when I got here that I could vote within two years in the New Zealand elections. You can vote. I yeah, can yeah, vote. Yeah. I, I did a master's. I did a year of study, and I could get do that for domestic fees. And it mm. you know, goes on and on. And I've always had a lot of Kiwi friends in, in Australia, so I was v- very well aware of the disparity between, yes, between yeah. the two. Of course, the other confession, as in Australia, that I'm going to make, is that I grew up thinking far lap. Pavlovas, Crowded House, Russell Crowe, um, et cetera, et cetera, were all true blue Australians. And, mm. you know, Australia has this tradition of wanting to claim Kiwi talent as their own. And, um, and there's even a fairly valiant attempt at the moment to steal the Prime Minister. I don't know if you <laughs> said... I know, isn't that funny? <laughs> saw the survey last year where uh, she was the preferred voted by 90... Something like 95% oh, of Australians no. voted her as the preferred Prime Minister against the Australian options. Um, so, <laughs> but that's been, that's been going on for a while, isn't it? Yes. Because al- almost all, and certainly Jean Devaney, was claimed... Were called Australian writers yes, or Australian very, painters. Very, very quickly, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, I was. My first books were published when I was living in Australia, and I, on the dust jacket it said I was a young Australian writer, and I and I just let it ride. I, you know, I just thought well, because especially well, I don't know what it would like nowadays, but in those days it was more advantageous. Mm, mm. Did you? How did it make you feel, though? Well, I was young, so I was. You know, when you're young, you mm. want to you want to try out being all sorts of you know different things, don't you? And um, so I, I, it, it didn't upset me. In fact, I think I found it quite exciting. Yeah, you re- you recall your first visit to Australia um, in this way. I'm just going to read a tiny little bit. When I think back to my impressions of Australia in 1985, when I first crossed the ditch, they were to do with animals and men. <laughs> Both were very different to what I was used to, louder, brighter and more exciting. You didn't have to go far out of town to see wallaby, kangaroo or emu. E- emu. Um, Australian men were just as loud and exotic. They flirted and made off-colour jokes and let you know if they thought you were gorgeous. <laughs> so Australian men were louder, brighter and more exciting and you ended up marrying one, of course. <laughs> Um, and Pākehā men, in, in, I think you say, seem frightened to flirt. And you, you put that down to sort of more fervent feminism in New Zealand at the time, being mm. part of the public discourse. Yes, well, there, I'm, I'm sh- sure many of you will remember this. This was, um, you know, after the infamous um, Mervyn Thompson incident. And, um, and, and, we, and we also had these statistics that were flying around New Zealand at that time, that one in four um, girls had been sexually abused, one in nine boys. Um, you know, there was, this, there was this sort of... In fact, the whole Me Too thing that's happening now, I don't know whether it's a facility of age, but I kind of feel like I'm reliving through something that I've already lived through in the past. And, and then for, for feminism, I mean, this is what's happened always, is two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. So, you know, I think that, um, I think that Pākehā men, or particularly educated Pākehā men, let's say, um, were very adversely affected mm-hmm. by, by this. And, and there was a lot of self-hatred of, of, you know, that they, that they experienced going on where, um, you know, when then we sort of swung back again and, and were kind of more, on, I think, on, a, on an even keel. Mm-hmm. So not, perhaps not so true. I think I think that you know I mean it's as I say at the beginning of this book you know it's diff- it is it's dangerous to sort of talk about national characteristics but I think mm. I think I think it is generally accepted that, that for um, the kind of um, you know white Australian white Anglo-Saxon uh, population and the and the you know what we've traditionally called the Parker thing here is uh, that, that that we are quiet quieter and I remember Australian women saying that to me with telling me I was ladylike and I thought well no one in New Zealand would ever think I was ladylike but, <laughs> you know, and, and there is a sort of um, quiet quietness often about um, about Parker which you don't experience so much with um, white Australians so you've already kind of answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it again because there might be another layer to it. What was the thing that drove you to research and write this book? I mean, it was that kind of interest in exploring the long history of, of New Zealanders who had emigrated to Australia like you did and your, and your, your children have. But 
What, what, what else was it that made you go, oh, I really want Well, it was these five people, really, because as I, I sort of came across them in, over my re in my reading over years and years and years, I started thinking about this book in 2011. And then I didn't really get a chance to write it until this, I was so lucky I got, I got a um, residency in uh, Wellington at the Randell Cottage. And I was terribly lonely in Wellington and very cold as well. And um, <laughs> both of those things just make you sit by the heater and work hard. And, um, and, um, and so, I, you know, I managed to sort of pull it all together then. But I, I, I had, you know, I had the, the, these, the five that I chose, uh, none of them are Māori because I thought, well, Māori New Zealanders, it's not actually Māori, Māori people, tend not to forget that they're New Zealanders. Whereas, um, whereas we will go to Australia and work very hard to get rid of our accents, you know, to try and, and fit in. And, um, and so, and, and these five, all of them became household names. They run the gamut from, as I said, Jean Devaney being a communist, you know, on the extreme left, right through to Eric Bohm, who was a right wing shock jock. And, um, and then these other, uh, other people in between. And, um, and not, none of them forgot that they were New Zealanders. They, they never um, pretended they weren't. And I, I was very interested in that. You know, what, why would some, why do so many of us try and expunge that, where, whereas you know others don't, and still lead successful ex lives? And, ex and especially in the, in, in, at this time that I'm writing about, the, the last of them died in 1985. Most of them died in the 1960s. Mm, mm. So. I'm interested in um, what whether they were a one in one way or the other a, a movement like say the Sydney Push or you know and the, those who who left the Sydney Push and mm. uh, Germaine Greer and Clive James and Robert Hughes who went to the UK mm. and actually inspired me to move to the UK when I mm. thought oh I'd better go to the UK to have a creative career because I can't yeah. do it in Australia. Well, New uh, Zealanders have done that yeah, too. You yeah. know, in fact, it was a bit of a class difference because if you if you came from a family with a f few dollars, then uh, you or you worked hard yourself, obviously, um, then you you know you might be able to go straight to England and 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 uh, and instead of using Australia as a stepping stone, which it mm. which it was for generations, mm. you know, mm. to get to get up further to, to the England or to America, usually to the UK, not so much to America. But um, yeah, so were the five, did, did they kind of, I mean, in the, your opening chapter, which I might get you to read a little bit of in a moment, they sort of crossed paths, but that was, Im some of it was imagined, wasn't it? That they were all there. At oh, the, yes, it's yeah, totally yeah, imagined. Totally imagined. So were they um, the equivalent of those sorts of, you know, kind of at, at the time, you know, in the 20s, 30s and 40s going part of a movement of artists moving to Australia or they're just a random collection is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. No, I don't think there was a, a movement like the, the Sydney Push. You know, I don't think there, there's anything that you could actually um, put a name to, but I might, I stand to be corrected. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think um, it, that people, in, you know, as, as this case now, if, you know, you, you want to make a living as, as a writer or an artist or anything, really. <laughs> You know, you go and you're in the bigger pop in a bigger population. You, you've all automatically got a bigger market, and with a much higher minimum wage. Yes, and a much higher wage, and 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 also when you're coming from the sort of colder regions of New Zealand, then you know a warmer climate. Yeah. So just before the reading, one more question, because um, I'm interested in how you've explained why you wrote about Jean, but I'd like to know about the others as well. Um, but first, I'm curious: were there, was there anyone that you researched who you decided to leave out of the story, um, or was well, it always these five and these five well, made it in? I did, in, in, ter in terms of like, I did, I did think a lot about having Carmel in there, who was a famous drag queen. But she, uh, she's only just recently died. And she, she was Māori, and I, and. Um, I mean, I have Māori characters in every single one of my novels. I am never, I've never worried, about, I mean, I have been, you know, I've never been told by a Māori reader, you've, you've got anything, you know, I'm very, you know, but we've gone through this whole period in New Zealand, which I, I um, talk about in the book, actually, which is so bizarre, where, where so many Pākehā writers just didn't even, I don't understand, really, I don't understand it, whether didn't, didn't attempt it. But I thought, if I, if I try and write about Carmel, that is going to really be like 
uh, probably years of work <laughs> in terms of who I will have to go and talk to. And it also kind of um, m will muddy what, what I just said. You know, I'm, I, I really just wanted to, it was clearer if I just looked at Pākehā. And mm. um, even though, I mean, I, her life, I mean, there's somebody, I, I don't think anyone has written her biography yet, but um, I, I'm probably not the person to do it. It probably does have to be done by a Māori writer. Mm. Okay, so would you like to do a little bit of a reading, introducing us to the all five of the characters? Well, this is just, um, it's a truncated version, but what, what I thought was, when I started, you know, how was I going to start this book? Because I wanted, I wanted to get them all together, the five of them. So I wrote a chapter called, which is the beginning of the book, A Gathering of New Zealanders and Australia, Australians in 1940 Sydney. So this is when they are all still alive, and... Um, and I'm, and I'm, some, some of them didn't know each other. Jean Devaney, Dulcie Deemer and Eric Bohm had, had all met um, one another. Um, uh, Eric, um, they, they didn't necessarily like each other, which is typically New, New Zealand. And, um, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, and, um, and um, Douglas Stewart, who was a very famous poet and playwright and also the editor of The Red Page, which was the... Um, literary page in the bulletin, and then he became a publisher for Angus and Robertson. He knew, he knew them all, but va very vaguely. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to sort of read. So I'm, I'm pretending that I'm taking my readers to an opening of an exhibition of Roland Wakelin. And um, Roland uh, Wakelin was a painter, and he became enormously famous. His, uh, um, his paintings are held in all the major Australian collections. So let's, we, we are arriving now at the gallery. <clears throat> Keep an eye out for the artist, Roland Wakelin. He's not a big man and won't stand out from the crowd, but he was the first artist ever to exhibit with Macquarie and has returned frequently ever since to, attract, to, to exhibit again. Not all the painters who show here can attract so many punters, but Wakelin is well loved and much respected, not only for his early revolutionary paintings, but also for the man he is. Solid, dependable, decent, a loving husband and father, a true and loyal friend. Not the usual characteristics for an artist, in fact, we could say that some artists born with those traits do their best to dispense with them in order to be taken seriously. <laughs> by the end of the century, the artist's narcissistic temperament will be desired by many and not all of them artists. Wakelin is not bothered with any of that nonsense. He is, as it happens, by birth and nature, a New Zealander. What's that? How can he be, by nature, a New Zealander? He's not Māori, is he? And even then, how may we attribute certain characteristics to a racial group without risking racism? Let's not quibble about that now. We have plenty of time to discuss, na to discuss national characteristics later. They do exist, though acknowledgement of them has fallen from favour. And I'll just leap ahead here and discuss some of the paintings. Um, oh yes, over there, that's Roland. The tall, thin woman with him? I do believe that's the communist novelist Jean Devaney. And seated over there, holding court with those young poets, that's the famous Douglas Stewart. Who would you like to meet first? Jean? No great beauty, Devaney, but interesting. Very tall and opinionated, abrasive, cocksure, I've heard her described as, which has a number of meanings if you think about it, keen on sex. Recently expelled from the Communist Party, but I hear they're thinking of having a back. We haven't seen much of her lately. She's been living in Queensland, apparently writing another book. The police up there like to harass her for her political beliefs. They keep her under surveillance. Her husband, Hal, is still in Sydney and has another woman, which Devaney can't get too upset about, since she was involved for years of their marriage with J.B. Miles, General Secretary of the Communist Party. A kind of open secret among those on the left, and yes, sorry, gossip. But the circle thrives on gossip. Apart from being a New Zealander, Devaney has one more thing in common with Wakelin. She did her most controversial work when young, but then, don't we all? Her 1926 novel, The Butcher Shop, banned in New Zealand, and a couple of her later ones, Cindy and Sugar Heaven, ruffled no end of feathers. If you're wanting to get on in Sydney to succeed, and let's assume you are, you're a New Zealander, aren't you? There's so many of them. Then Stuart is the one you need to know. 
enormously influential. He's the editor of the Red Page and the Bulletin. You can get the Bulletin over there in New Zealand. Stuart grew up in Taranaki, reading the Bushman's Bible, as they call the magazine here. The Red Page is the literary side of it. And he's a writer himself, of course. And then I, I sort of talk a little bit about um, some of his work. And later, when we spend some time with him, we'll hear what Witi Ehimaira thought when he read one of Stuart's Māori stories in primary school. A kafafal at the door, and it's two more New Zealanders. One, of, one is Queen of Bohemia, Dulcie Dima, writer and bon vivant, arriving in her skin-tight leopard-skin suit, which is starting to look a little worse for wear. Later on, after enough liquid refreshment, she may well do the splits. She's famous for it. Right now, she's hanging decorously on the arm of journalist Eric Bohm, who is wearing one of his 20 ludicrous fantasy self-designed uniforms, clanking with medals, although he's seen no active service. As one of his biographers will point out, other men were jailed for wearing medals they hadn't won. But Bohm seems to get away with it. anything. Adultery, appalling novels dictated at tens of thousands of words a day, false news reports filed during his years as war correspondent. Recently, Douglas Stewart's Red Page published the shortest book review ever in response to the second volume of Bohm's memoirs, I Have Lived Another Year. The review read simply, why? <laughs> 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 he wouldn't have got paid very much for that if he was a freelancer, That's would he? Right, one word, 50 cents. Your opening chapter is titled Why Too? Oh, yes, yes. Why did I go? <laughs> yeah. And why this book? Why, why did, yes, yeah. and why, I, why, why did you go yeah, to Australia? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you write early on that um, Jean Devaney loomed large in your life as a young writer. How and when did you get to know the others? I, look, honestly, it's terrible. I can't really remember. <laughs> I can't, I, um, um, Dul Dulcie Dima, I saw a profile about her um, in the Sydney Morning Herald probably 10, 15 years ago, just a little thing that somebody had written because she, had, she was crowned the Queen of Bohemia in the Haymarket in 1927. And she uh, was notorious. She, she liked to have, I mean, it all seems very innocent to our eyes now, but she'd have kissing competitions and she, li she liked to have part hold parties where everybody was in the nude and she'd go around measuring the men's sexual organs. I mean, she's batty. And, but she made a lot of money uh, writing novels, which like, if she was alive now, she'd be, she would be writing one of those sort of big um, historical fantasy TV series. Like um, she, she, she wrote, sort of historical fantasy so uh, one of the novels I discuss in the in the book um, is a book which which has got Jesus in it as a main character you know so it happens during you know the biblical, biblical times obviously and and um, the ABC I tracked down uh, the, the ABC television years ago um, in the in the 70s had interviewed her and you can find that on 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 YouTube now it's uh, available and um, and she has a real plum in her mouth her her father was a doctor they, her parents were free thinkers so she was born in Christchurch and then when she was about eight or nine they moved to Featherston. Um, and um, they used to run around in the in the nude and and um, and and swim. She was mad all her life. She loved to swim, and she she won a short story competition when she was only sixteen um, with the, for an Australian magazine called The Lone Hand, and um, and she ran away off to Australia. Well, she actually married a, a man much older than her, she, whom she dispensed with, but um, not before she had unfortunately had quite a lot of children, and she didn't like any of them, and um, and so she sort of just dumped them on her her mother. And her mother was a, had sort of turned away from her kind of wild, where she was a convert to Catholicism, uh, sort of late, a late convert to Catholicism. So she, she, she did look up, you know, she was a good grandmother and she, she took on all these. Um, and if, when Dulcie was interviewed, she always used to talk about my young, which the children always found amusing because it was like she was talking about a litter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. really interested in it. 
Well, it was, it was, it was pre-birth control, wasn't it? So, That's right. You know, she loved women... sex, and so unfortunately yeah. she just kept having babies. Yeah, when she was early. I think <laughs> D- Diana Wishtel wrote in The Listener a rev- in a review of West Island, um, if she, referring to Dulcie, um, hadn't existed, Stephanie Johnson, might have, um, who always likes a good story, <laughs> might have made her up. <laughs> She's almost she... too good to be oh, true, yeah, isn't she? she? Is. She's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. So, so that, that was... Maybe that little piece of paper. What about Douglas Stewart and? Well, Douglas Stewart, I, I did, I had, I had heard of. Um, it's actually more from um, Australians um, because he he was he was taught um, my generation of Australians of Australian people and and sort of the next generation older were were taught Douglas Stewart at his work at school. Mm. And um, he he and he had he wrote a couple of very famous long um, verse plays, um, which of course is a, a, a genre which has almost ceased to exist. Um, about one about um, uh, Hillary and another one not Hillary, Captain Scott, you know the Scott of the Antarctic. And so that when Captain Oates said, "I'm going outside now, maybe some time," that 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 was it was he sort of reintroduced that into the Australian lexicon. That sort of was something that had been forgotten, but it was a sort of, you know. Um, he also wrote a play called the Gold, uh, the Golden Lover. He, he uh, whereas New Zealand writers now are very loath to. Um, to to delve into don't use Maori legends and mythology in their own work. Uh, his generation of New Zealand writers did a lot, a lot. and uh, he wrote a play called The Golden Lover, which was based on Maori legend. And yeah, I just sort of I just knew about him. You know, he'd sort of I'd come across him again and again. And he and he and he and he, and he was a, um, a a wonderful poet. Mm. You may be interested to know Wesi Hamara on Friday called for people to write about more Māori myths and legends. And I don't think he was just referring to Māori writers, I think. He's calling for everyone to... Well, that's with you. That's one voice. Yeah, Yeah. one voice, true. Um, Now, Eric Baum was... I think you say somewhere that he was quite... Maybe it was at the Auckland Writers Festival. You called him repugnant. <laughs> he, 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 yeah. No, he was he was a terrible man. But you see, <laughs> I also I I was very mindful of the fact that a lot of I mean not all biographers and historians are of the left persuasion, but many of mm. us are, and so and so therefore we don't look too closely at at right right wing people and i think it's very important that we do because it, it's dangerous not to understand that that what that, makes them? that way of thinking and it's all very easy and glib to so to say well you know ignorance is is fear and and um, and so or, or you know there's the and, and the whole sort of conservative mindset you you get what you've got and you hold on to it for yourself and for and and for your family and all of that but Bohm is so fascinating because he was I mean, like we've all we've probably all met men like him. You know, he was a he was a, a gambler, a liar, a womanizer, but also in very charismatic and attractive. You know, he, women were attracted to him. Um, he 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 didn't have many male friends. I mean, at different times he would have close male friends, but then they'd get pissed off with him because he was such a raging egocentric. But he got away with murder. He you know that little bit I just read. You know, and he went to London and he was reporting it though in those days for the Australian Truth, which, you know, the, the tr- truth became a tabloid, but in those days, truth was was not so much of a tabloid. It was more of a serious newspaper. And um, and he just made stuff up all the time and, and sent it sent it back as, yeah. as news. And, and he did, when he, we, 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 he won a, uh, quali- am I saying this right, the Quai la Guerre, the French medal. He, in a, he he got a French general, whatever he was, who had, who had been awarded this in the First World War. They got he got him really really drunk um, in France and um, gambled for it and got had got this and wore it. Mm. Uh, he won it and uh, gambling and um, and he, and he did he never act, of course because he wasn't a soldier he, he didn't see active service but he did he was just behind the the the, um, the fighting a couple of times in France and he loved it. He, 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 you know, he loved actually being that close to the, and he saw um, some, you know, so you know, prisoners of war, Germans killing them, and blah blah blah. You know, he mm. he wouldn't have been friends with any of the other. 
Well, he no, he tried to join. He tried to join Dulcie Deemer's outfit because, of course, he loved the idea of of all of that naughtiness. But then he wrote an article about them, and they didn't want all that in public, mm. and so he got banished. He wasn't allowed to be in their group anymore until he he had to do penance. I think he had to walk the full length of a room on his knees and kiss the floor or carry I can't remember. Mm. And they let him back in again because there were quite a few um, quite well known uh, sort of S Sydney society people who would because you know they found Dulcie very in intoxicating company and. Yeah. So they, she, they didn't want their names bandied around in the press. So Devaney, I think uh, you reveal, termed uh, the, the phrase, uh, coined the term politically correct back in the 1930s. Yes, yes. Yeah. Devaney, Devaney would say that's politically incorrect and she would tell people that is not politically correct thinking. So as I say in the book, I'm not sure it's something we really want to claim as much as we want to claim Pavlova and everything else, <laughs> but... But she did. She she could be very didactic, and and um, but but also just marvellous. I, I think I would have I would have loved to have met mm. her. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. remember that bit in the book where you said, of all of the five of them that you wrote about, yes. you would have most yeah, liked to have met her." Yeah, I would have. I would have liked very much liked to have been able to meet her. So, what about the odd one out, Wakeling, being the painter, the painter, rather than the than the writer? Mm -mm. Well, he he his uh, he painted a uh, as a lot of them did at that time things that were like the Sydney Harbour Bridge. He painted and painted and painted it, you know, as it was being um, um, built. He painted. He he's his, we only have one of his paintings in. Um, <coughs> I think it's in the Wellington collection. Um, he, uh, somebody offered the Auckland Art Gallery one of his paintings quite more recently, and they didn't they didn't want it. Um, but he is held in all the major collections in Australia, and he was a, he was a colour theorist. So he was. Um, it's sort of hard for us to understand now because Im images go around the world now like that, and and he um, the, and, and he he remembered Wakelin remembered um, a, a, a young painter coming back from her sort of European tour, you know, a young woman of a, of, of means who had gone on a European tour, and she had she came back with colour pictures of Van Gogh and. Um, you know, earlier painters and as well as some of the modernists. And they, all these young um, painters, of which he was one, having just moved to, uh, to he would went to Sydney in 1913, um, they were just so, it was just so mind boggling, you know. And, um, it, he, you know, he, so he really, he, he Grace Cosington, Grace Cosington, Cosington Smith and Lloyd Rees were really the leading painters of their mm. generation. And totally claimed by Australia. Yes. Yeah. And he yeah. also, of all of them, it's a bit of a stretch for me to say that he, uh, he <laughs> stayed a proud New Zealander because he only ever came home again once. Yeah. And many, did anyone else come home? I don't think. Oh, Bohm did. Oh, Bohm did, Boehm, yeah. Bohm, um, his father was a Liberal MP. Bohm was born in Grafton. They were a Jewish family. And, um, and his mother was an American woman. And um, after Bohm's father died, he, Bohm did sort of feel some sort of sense of responsibility to his mother. So he did, he, he did, um, he did make visits back to uh, New Zealand right up until when she died. She had remarried. She had um, convert, converted to Christianity. But um, he, 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 you know, he liked to come back to New Zealand. And one of the reasons he loved to come back to New Zealand was that particularly on the West Coast, they could pick up Australian radio. And he, for, for much of his life, he was a, you know, he had these sort of very right wing uh, talk back shows. He was the voice at the parish pump, they called him. And so people would recognise his voice. And he loved, he loved being famous. So he was the Mike Hoskins. Yes, he was the beginning of the Mike Hoskins, the Alan Jones, the sort of all of that. Mm, mm. So yourself coming back to New Zealand. That was a so long you, time ago now. Yeah, so you, <laughs> you were there for... Only five years, Only really. five years, okay. But you have spent periods in Yeah, yeah no, in we've Australia gone back and, yeah. um, for, for work or, um, you know, um, my husband Tim is a film editor and so he occasionally cuts uh, films in Australia and sometimes he lets me go with him. And, um, and of course, I have two children who, who live there now. Mm. And, and also until 2017, my closest friend, um, uh, but she's died now, so... 
which was Rosie Scott, who was a, an, another New Zealand, she was a New Zealander, a New Zealand writer and, uh, of some repute, and who, um, who went to Australia at 40 and, and, um, and took Australian citizenship and stayed. Mm. So your first couple of novels were published in Australia while yeah. you were living mm. there. Um, how difficult was it or easy was it when you came back to New Zealand to kind of find publishers here and... Um, it was set right. off, continue on with your, your writing there was, career. No, it was a collection of short stories mm. that was published okay. there. It wasn't one... I, I, okay. I hadn't had a novel and a book of poems. Um, when, when I came back, um, Wendy Harricks, um, who had a little publishing company called The New Women's Press... So she published my first novel, and then she and then she went off down. She was actually at Otago. She took over at Otago, but I stopped publishing with her once she was at Otago, and then then really ever since have mostly published with um, Random House mm. Mm. In, in New Zealand. Mm. Yeah. So with the late. Um, Peter Lloyd, you started the Auckland Writers... Peter Wells. Sorry, Peter Wells. Look, oh, right. Look, I knew that. I, I know, just looked at Lloyd that. and I went... Oh, I know, but you're tired. It's the last session. But we should... <laughs> let's give her a round of applause. It's a wonderful sorry. festival. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Peter Wells, I'm sorry, Peter. Um, you started the Auckland Writers Festival mm. in 99, was it? 19. We started Eight. meeting in, for it in about 1990. I don't think the first, yeah, the first festival was 1999. 99. So this wasn't long after um, the first two Australian festivals started, which was yes. Byron and Sydney um, in 97 and Melbourne in 98. Although Auckland, uh, Adelaide had been going on for oh, Adelaide, decades. Adelaide had been yeah, going yeah. forever. Well, I was at the Sydney Writers' Festival when I got the idea for it. I, well, I, I was going to say, how significant was your time in uh, Australia to really, making this happen back in... I was, sitting, I was sitting... I'd gone over for the... Uh, the they launched a, the, um, an Australian edition of one of my books, The Whistler, um, which is a science fiction novel, um, in 1996. Seven, six, something. and um, John Pilger was on stage, and, and it was at the Sydney Writers Festival, and it was the most wonderful thing. And 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 I'd never seen anything like it. And they had microphones set up here on either on these two aisles, and people come up and ask John Pilger questions, and everyone was getting very kind of racked up. And I was sitting there thinking, it is insane in a city the size of Auckland, we do not have mm. anything like this, you know. And I was sick of jokes that Wellingtonians tell, tell like, um, what's the difference between a pot of yogurt? in Auckland. Yogurt's got culture and uh. things like that. And so I thought, right, right. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, <laughs> so I went back to Auckland and I was talking to Harriet Allen about it and she said, oh, Peter, was, Peter Wells has been talking about that too. And I didn't really know Peter very well then. So I rang him up and I said, well, come on, let's get, let's do it. And, and, um, and we did eventually you know it, it um, we gathered you know you gather people around you and 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 now it's enormous it's kind of almost got unwieldy it's so enormous and um and i'm you know and Anne o'brien is this very passionate and quite fierce uh, director and um and, and it'll yeah it's it's I mean, I heard uh, a few years ago um, that there was this, or you know, a couple of years ago, there was an idea that writers' festivals around the world were starting to die, to go, and that, that they that they would become more sort of festivals of ideas and things. But I don't think that, you know, that, I don't think that prediction has come true. I think, I think people like to come together and and talk about books and writing and ideas and. I mean, they can't be really separated. They sort of go so hand in hand. Mm. That hasn't been my experience either. They're sort of getting bigger and more yeah, sessions yeah. <laughs> mm. still. Um, so your book is a really interesting his, history of Australian, uh, New Zealand. Oh, I said Australian. New Zealand literature. <laughs> um, but one thing I thought was really interesting was that you notice that note that women wrote the majority of New Zealand books between the 1920s yeah, and did. the 1970s. That is an yeah. absolute yeah. fact. Yeah, we did. Women wrote the majority of New Zealand books in New Zealand, published books yeah. between 1920 and 1947, or something. But 
but it was still very much dominated by men. They, you know, in terms of men were the ones that were making, um, that were sort of in the light, the male writers were more, you know, so the uh, Alan Kernos and et cetera of this world were the ones that were m much more in the limelight than, and they, and they, and in fact even, and they had the easier, the men generally too had the easier lives. And even of the five I've, I've put in my book, the three men, even though they're all like chalk and cheese, they're all so different. Most of them, apart from Bohm and all his problems he caused himself, but the, 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 the other two men, were they, they, they struggled at times, they did endure hardship and whatever, but really they were okay. Dulcie Demer and, and, and Jean Devaney knew real penury. There's a, there's a photograph in there of Jean. She, she looks like skin and bone, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, just, just to get enough to eat, you know, was a struggle. Yeah. At times. So there's an extraordinary amount of research that's gone into yes. this. Yes. Massive. I know, it should be a much bigger book, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, but how, and, and, and a very interesting structure. So we, we, we start with an introduction to each of the five. In between that, there's pieces of memoir, your own, mm. your own story. Um, and then we come to the, into the, sec, sort of the second half of the book where we go into a particular time, a date, a year, that is significant for one of the five's lives and you sort of look at what was happening for each of them. And how did you decide on the structure? It's really unusual, and, but it's also captivating because it's just... Well, uh, it, it, there's only, I think it. there's only t two little chapters. I, I wasn't going to put anything about me in it, and, I, and I, I, we were just talking about Peter. I gave Peter an early draft of it to read, and he said, no, "Darling, you've got to put more of yourself in there. No one wants to read this stuff unless it's, you know, because he he always put a lot of himself in his, and which is the mo not modern. It's been going on now for about forty years, I think, or <laughs> thirty years. Uh, you know that this is the way people, you know, you don't just write this dry sort of stuff. But um, so I only uh, there's only a couple of there. But so the the main the main structure is so it's points of origin. So I talk about the, the my the, their lives in New Zealand, and then um, life in West Island, which is the sort of bigger half. You know, then it's not there's, that's the sort of bulk of the book is their is their lives in in Australia and where the, at times that did um, in, uh, uh, intersect. And also it was a very uh, kind of efficient way of looking also at the, the, the major movements of, of the kind of mid 20th century because that was when they were practicing their art or their or their writing or their journalism whatever they were doing and and the, and what you know what was going on in the, in the world and in Australia at that time so there's a bit of talk about the white Australia policy um, the, the 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 um the sort of vagaries of and of ill fate and, and whatever of the of, of the CA the CAP the Communist Party of Australia and um yeah, it was just it just sort of you know it sort of made sense to me. I mean, it was like I th that it, it was that that would would be how I'd have to to tell it. Mm. So the structure was always like that. It wasn't something that you had to constantly, you know, look at. Oh, I, how I, I, I had to fiddle about it. a bit yeah. with where where I put the bits about myself, which um yeah. Yeah, which I really enjoy and I think kind of hold it all together really nicely. But also when you dive deep into the stories of the five New Zealanders, there's also lots of commentary and authorial mm. insight from you, which I, I think... Well, I ended up enjoyed. writing an afterword, which was because um, by the time... Because um, I finished the book in 2000 and... 17 towards the end of 2017 well, of course what went on last year when all this stuff had started happening with the 501s which are the the new zealanders they've been deporting and a lot of those 501s let's be honest they're bad boys a lot of them are but the problem is that they're, they're not new they, they they they've got australian accents <laughs> they, they've never lived here and so they get sent back here and almost immediately commit another crime or they get into some sort of trouble or we've had a few suicides you know because they're so lost they're just young lost boys and um and it is it is barbaric Mm. And so I had to put that in. I had yeah. to say, you know, yeah. why? I, 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 it makes heart feel people. Why are you behaving as though you hate us? <laughs> why? When we've so, contributed so much. Do you think mm -hmm. with... It, you write about in the afterword as well how difficult it was to get this book published and because it was like Australians, like, why would they want to read a book about New Zealand as New Zealand? Why would they want to well, read... Yeah, a little, Douglas a, Stewart, a he, the, when I finished the chapter about him, his last chapter, he, one of the things he, he said repeatedly through his life was that, that in, his, in, New Ze in New Zealand, everyone thought of him as, as an Australian, and in Australia, everyone thought of him as a New Zealander. So he really was somebody who really felt that he was somehow stuck in the middle. And, um, 
And I, I know I'm just so grateful to Rachel Scott because she, she I mean, long live the, the university publishers. You know, we're so lucky that we still have them because they're not, they still, of course, have the commercial imperative, but, but not as much as the big trade publishers do. And, um, and, and they, will, they will take a punt on a, on, on a book that will, will look at some sort of esoteric, uh, strange little corner of our history. And, um, and so Rachel saw that, and, 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 and um, I know I've never asked her what she thinks about me putting that in the afterword. And she probably doesn't approve of that at all, but, but it's the truth, you know. It's like they, 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 it was a book that could have just so easily just fallen through the cracks and disappeared. Mm. But we really need some more Australians to read it. Well, it was reviewed in Landfall by Lucy Sussex, who's a, a professor at um, Adelaide, is she? Mm -hmm. Anyway, she, she banged on about that, about how it needs to be read by Australians. But you see, the thing about Australia, I mean, that, that they're looking north. They don't look at Tasmania, the forgotten state, and they don't, and they don't really, they're not very interested in us at all. So, so it's, um, but I'm sure, I mean, it, it is in the shops in Australia. I'm, I don't think it's a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Maybe but some visits to some Australian <laughs> literary festivals will help them along the way. <laughs> it would be nice. Um, so I, we're almost out of time, but I, we will take a couple of questions. And I'd love to hear your story about the origins of West Island. So just over here, we'll start with this lady in the blue top. So, yep. Thank you. I apologise for uh, butting in before. Sorry. That's okay. That's I forgot okay. all about that. <laughs> um, we were holidaying in Stuart Island about mm, 25, 30 years ago, and we were in the little information centre, and they had uh, a video playing. And it was in that video that they referred to New Zealand as it has four islands. North Island, South Island, Stewart Island. Stewart Island, and the Great Western Island. And we'd, oh. we'd never heard of it at that time. So I don't know. I don't, yes. still don't know where it came from, but no. it certainly was in that. Oh, look, it's probably been a silly joke for yes, a hundred years. Yeah, but I think you're right. It is part of the zeitgeist now, and maybe, mm. you know, mm. certainly something that I feel comfortable with calling my former country. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, Liz. Um, mine isn't a question, it's just really uh, thank you for starting the Auckland Readers and Writers Festival. Yeah. I go every year and it's one of the highlights of my year. Oh, good. So, um, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Stephanie, go you, good on you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> And, yeah. <laughs> um, Phil, over that side, Hella. Um, did the slump in women writers occur in Australia? Because it's not until the late 70s, early 80s that New Zealand women writers are the same proportion as they were in 1920. And the same is true of the proportion of women in professional roles or the university. It leaches its lowest point in the 1970s, doesn't catch up till the 1920s, until the late 70s. Is this a New Zealand phenomena? Is it an Australian phenomena? Do you have any views about why post-war New Zealand would have been such a low point for women writers, intellectuals and publishers? Well, I think the, 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 the most obvious answer, I might be wrong, but it is, is just what the, that post-war conservatism, you know, where, where after the war, after the ex terrifying, hideous experiences in the war, p people wanted the domestic, safe, quiet life where you were, you know, secure and warm and you had your children and you had your roof over your head and you had food in your belly and, you know, and women were... You know, we did. We went backwards then, didn't we? After the sort of liberal thinking of the the, the tens and twenties and the flappers and all the fun, and and then suddenly, you know, after the war, the marriage rate got much younger, and 
you know, women were marrying in their late teens, early 20s. So, it, it, yes, it was just sort of really so much to do with the war. Can't hear her. I'm she sorry. said, "Did it happen in Australia?" Yes. Oh, that conservatism was it was in uh, everywhere, wasn't it? It was England, America. I mean, in the West, England, America, Canada. One more quick question, if anyone has one. Okay, keeping hello. Yes, it's now. very making a very <laughs> fit. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, ladies. Um, one quick question, the term the ditch, um, do you know who that can be attributed to and what period of history that was first started to be used? Uh, it's probably 19th century as well, oh no it wouldn't be 19th century, I, 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 I would say early mid 20th century, you know I mean it, it, it's only, it only takes uh, three or four days to cross the Tasman and uh, you know and when people were going over on the um, on the ste on the liners and that you know it's not it's not a long uh, not a long trip. In fact, um, I haven't got one up on stage. When when I was writing this book, at the same time I wrote a novel, um, another, another Lily Woodhouse novel, which I s ended up self-publishing. Long story, and I've done it very badly. But it's cheap. It's twenty dollars. My husband's got some to sell if you want one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That, that's that. That is set at the same. That this, at this, you know, in the middle, mid twentieth century, and it's um, and it has a sort of that, that. These Australians that have been living in Wellington for eighteen years, and they go back, go back to uh, Australia to try and find out. There's a. It's a sort of murder mystery, but um, it, it was interesting. You know, the, just the, the the to read then about the enormous amount of traffic back and forth. I mean, now we can hop on a plane and we're there and you know, three hours, but in those days people didn't think so much of it. If you, you went sort of way down, it was cheap, you know, to be right down the bottom of the boat, you could... Mm. And presumably... go across the ditch. Yeah, impression of a big, you know, much deeper part of the ocean to, to cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, um, just to finish, one last comment, question about the... Um, I think you called it an invisible curtain hanging between mm. New Zealand and Australia still, in terms of cultural exchange anyway, isn't it? Mm. Rather than... It's not so much when but it comes you know, to I football. suppose I suppose that's normal and natural. You know, um, it's um, you know, uh, uh, literature is uh, often is is provincial. You know, the the Americans want to read about the Americans. The Palms want to read about the Palms. The Australians want to read about the Australians. We in New Zealand are very unusual. New Zealand um, booksellers. I don't know. Maybe you you could disabuse me of this notion, but I have been told over the years that that we don't like to read about like New Zealand fiction doesn't move. You hear it again and again. It, it's very you know like. Uh, um, you know, probably, uh, you know, we're more likely to rush off and buy the latest Ian McEwan than we are to go and buy the latest Greg McGee. I mean, I know Greg McGee and Ian McEwan have just both recently had new novels out, and I'd be very curious to know, uh, as Greg McGee is sort of being one of our leading writers, or he's well, more well known as a playwright and a television writer, but he's not a bad novelist, um, that, you know, that, that, that in fact, his last book, Family Secrets, is really good. Unnecessary Secrets is really good. And it came out about the same time as um, Machines Like Me. And we probably bought per capita far more Ian McEwan than we did Greg. You know, I don't know. But, uh, but I also think that because we're so far away from anywhere else that, that we, we can't just read New Zealand fiction. We, well, otherwise, we go insane. You know, we have, to, we have to read books from all over the world. But... Uh, but yeah, we're less, we are possibly the most, the least provincial, I think, as readers in that, in that we are very, New Zealand is generally very eclectic. Well, that's a good note to end on and to celebrate, isn't it, that we read <laughs> widely and, and, and let's keep reading, everybody. So please join me in thanking Stephanie Johnson very much. Will you be available to sign some books? Yes, come and have a chat to Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because this is the last session, I'd also um, like to thank the rest of the team because it is a oh, totally a team. team effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, of course, my colleagues um, Charlie Unwin, Amanda Rain, and Michaela Blackman, in, um, who 
I've been working with all year on this. Big thanks to Paige and Blackmore again for being the principal sponsor of the festival of the Puka Puka Talks part of the festival. Um, huge thanks to Yanya, our sound engineer, who's been recording all of this for podcasts, which will be available. Stay tuned. If you want to find out about the podcast, just make sure you've signed up to the Nelson Arts Festival email newsletter because we'll send out a, an email when they're all ready. Um, a huge thanks to the ushers. I've really enjoyed working with the ushers this year. It's been fantastic. And to Bex and Jeremy and their staff in the cafe. It's all been really awesome. I've probably forgotten someone. Thank you. Oh, boy. Hella, 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 my, my right-hand person. I looked at you and then I went away and I thought I'd said it already. Um, it's been fabulous. I've had a lot of fun. I am very tired now. And, um, but thanks all very much. Big thank you to you, the audience, for coming along and supporting these events. Really, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival, Page and Blackmore, Puka Puka Talks.